this time we've got an all-science special show for you. Whoa! <laughs> the Gadget Show Big Experiment. Where the Gadget Show takes on science. Look at this guy. I'm the eleven. John and I use the scientific principles of speed as we try to make a football go supersonic. With jet cars, robot legs, rockets, dragsters and some jolly big guns, this is a science project like no other. And also coming up in this Gadget Show science special... Otis travels to the States to meet some very clever scientists who've come up with a way of powering our gadgets wirelessly. No wires. And I'll be doing my own wee science experiment, getting some big reactions and explaining why. That's amazing! Hello and welcome to a special edition of The Gadget Show. The Gadget Show Big Experiment. Yes, this week we've decided to put all our MP3 players and camcorders and other gadgets to one side and delve fearlessly into the world of science. And never before have you seen two more likely <laughs> candidates to be involved in The Gadget Show's Big Experiment. Yeah, and so it was that we found ourselves in a chilly but sunny field about to take part in a scientific challenge. Gadget Show Science Challenge. I like the sound of that. Science, extending your knowledge <laughs> by systematic means. Nicely put. As long as we get to wear white jackets and have clipboards. <laughs> okay, that's all I'm after. You've already got the glasses. I have my big, brainy glasses. Oh, Ooh. hang on. Here we go. Here it is. Thank you very much. OK, good morning, gentlemen. Your challenge is very simple. Using science, you need to try and score a supersonic goal. Great! This is making your ball travel faster than the speed of sound. Brilliant! Do this and you'll win the challenge. There, told you it was simple. Good, good luck. luck and Godspeed! The speed of sound is, of course, the speed at which sound travels through the air. And anything that travels faster than the speed of sound is said to be travelling at supersonic speed. Although it does vary a bit depending on air temperature, the generally accepted speed of sound is 767 miles per hour. And so to keep things simple, that was the target we were aiming for. But this was a challenge, and so it would be the first to score a goal at that speed who won. First, though, we got together for a bit of research. And the obvious place to find out how hard it was going to be was the football field. Taking penalties. You have no idea how hopeless I am in this fear. Okay. <laughs> Using a simple right. radar gun reading kilometres per hour, okay. we could measure the speed of our penalties. But after ten attempts, I'd only managed a top speed of 82 kilometres per hour. That's just over 50 oh. miles per hour. We needed help, so we called in some experts who take their footy a bit more seriously. Now, the speed of the ball when you kick it is achieved by the transfer of energy from the muscles in your body through your foot to the ball. Kicking the ball as hard as possible is all about transferring as much energy as possible into the ball. Firstly, energy builds in the run-up. Then swinging your leg from the hip adds even more energy. And then at the very last second, straightening your leg from the knee increases the velocity of your foot even further. Finally, as your foot connects with the ball for just 16 milliseconds, all of that energy is transferred to the ball. Yeah. Look at this guy. 111 kilometers an hour. That's nearly 69 miles an hour. But not only is that some way off the world record of 80.1 miles per hour, it's also nowhere near the speed of sound. So, with simple kicking out, we had to explore other options. And I was thinking the best way to make something go quickly is to attach a whopping great engine to it. Now that is a dragster, designed expressly to accelerate from there to there incredibly quickly. And I want to find out firsthand what that feels like. Santa Pod Racetrack and a 9.8-litre engine dragster were the perfect way to experience the type of accelerations I was going to need to put my football through to get it supersonic. As we would only have a limited space in which to score the goal, acceleration was crucial. We needed to reach our top speeds very quickly. Here we go! Here we go! This is it! This is the one! <sighs> my heart is in my mouth right now. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! 
at its peak, my dragster was going at 169 miles per hour. But it's this thing's acceleration that is truly impressive. It gets from 0 to 100 miles per hour in just 2.5 seconds. So, the big question, what makes this car so fast? Well, oxygen-rich fuel and huge sticky tyres that don't slip and waste power are important. But the most important factor in carrying a car like this as quickly as possible is its power-to-weight ratio, giving the car as much power as possible and making it as light as possible. Our football is very, very light. And so, if I could strap it to something delivering a monumental amount of power, that could give it enough acceleration to blast it through the sound barrier. And while Jason was getting all fast and furious, my method of scoring a supersonic goal was going to use a very different power source. Jason's dragster, of course, uses constant force to keep it moving and keep it accelerating. But being a bit of a purist, I want to devise a method of scoring a supersonic goal with a kick. That is force that impacts on my ball and sends it flying into the goal. And with explosives, you can get one hell of a kick. The basic principle of a gun is simple. The explosion of gunpowder causes the air behind the bullet to expand instantaneously, blasting the bullet out of the barrel with enough force to propel it, in this case, supersonically. All I need to do now is find a gun big enough to let me fit my football down the barrel, and I reckon I've got this challenge sewn up. Marvellous. So, we'd both chosen different methods for getting our ball supersonic. I would be staying traditional and kicking mine, hitting it with enough force to punch it through the sound barrier. Whereas after my ride in the dragster, I wanted to find a way of strapping a flipping great big engine to mine, which would then accelerate it to and then through the sound barrier. Oh, my God! That was amazing. I was that scary. It looked quite scary. The, the dragster. dragster was incredible. It's difficult to get it across. I mean, OK, the top speed is impressive, but it's not out of the ballpark. What's amazing is the acceleration. I mean, that thing just goes so quickly. Amazing. Seriously cool. Hello and welcome back to the Gadget Show Big Experiment. Next up, Gail shows how something as simple as corn flour, when mixed with a little scientific know-how, can make mere mortals like you and I do that whole walk on water thing that messiahs are into. Have you ever thought what an amazing thing corn flour is? It's great to use around the kitchen. It's good for thickening things like soups and sauces. It's also the basic ingredient in custard, but that is just the start of it. Check out this recipe. Into a heavy-duty blender or cement mixer, if you have one handy, add your corn flour to an equal measure of water. As I'm using 125 kilograms of corn flour and 125 litres of water, I've got a kids' paddling pool in which to pour out my charmed mixture. Now, what we have here is a pool full of very gloopy liquid. If I put my hand in, it's very definitely liquid. But what happens if I decide to take my shoes off and roll my trousers up and go for a dance? I wonder. Hey, look at me! I'm dancing! I'm running! I'm fast! It's solid! It's not liquid anymore! Isn't this amazing? A corn flour and water mixture is what's known as a dilatant fluid, one that begins to exhibit properties of a solid when put under extreme pressure. When I mix the corn flour and the water together, the corn flour didn't dissolve. It's simply suspended in the surrounding water molecules. And when extreme force is applied, i.e. me jumping up and down, the water is forced out of the gaps between the corn flour granules. Friction between them increases and they act like a solid. But as soon as you stop applying pressure, the water molecules slip back between the corn flour granules, which lubricates them, and so the mixture begins to behave like a liquid again, and I sink. Oh, please, give me a hand. Please. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. Give me a hand! Come on, please! <laughs> that was absolutely amazing! I must admit, when they said to me, jump on it, I was thinking, this is not going to work. <laughs> I'm not surprised! <laughs> I'm going to go, boom, but I couldn't believe it. This is the same stuff here, it right? It is. Corn it's, flour it's and liquid water. Look, like, completely liquid. Mm -hmm. Look at but... that. You can, yeah, beautiful. OK, so if I do this, for example, theoretically... <laughs> oh, <laughs> man, it's so cool! I want to share with you one of the most amazing bits of scientific progress I have ever seen. 
Nearly every gadget we use requires power, and where we get this power from has been the same ever since John was a little boy. Eons. The plug socket. And where you get these, excuse me, Amy, you get these. What if I told you that these could very well soon be a thing of the past? Inside this unassuming former clothing factory outside Boston, they're developing a technology that will change the world. The company's name, Ytricity, is a pretty big clue as to what they're developing here. Yes, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Very good indeed. I'm very excited about your wireless electricity, so please take me through it. What I'd like to show you is a television set. Even though I knew I was there to experience wireless power, nothing can quite prepare you for the first time you see a TV switched on which is being powered wirelessly. You're looking at a color television set <laughs> working completely without wires. No wires. The Ytricity system uses electromagnetic energy rather than wires to provide power. This source coil hidden here behind the painting turns mains electricity into electromagnetic waves, which are picked up by another receiving coil in the base of the telly. That turns it back into electricity, which in turn powers the TV. That's amazing. The workings are, of course, top secret, but the tech is similar to something much more familiar. Inside millions of everyday household electrical appliances, such as mobile phone chargers, are two coils which transfer electricity wirelessly over short distances. The genius of Ytricity is that they've enabled the transfer of electricity over much larger distances by utilising the principle of magnetic resonance. What Eric and his team have done is perfected the technique of making the magnetic field resonate at exactly the correct frequency to transmit power from one coil to another over distances of up to 1.5 metres. And it's not just big things that Ytricity are aiming to juice up without wires. I don't know if you have a mobile phone on you. I, I have. You're going to charge my mobile phone using that? Right. Imagine we could have this built into the telephone, yes. but for purposes of the demonstration here, we'll just plug it into your charging port. Let's walk up towards the computer that's being powered from the wall. It's charging! <laughs> it's charging! My phone is charging with absolutely no wires. The charge icon is on. Ytricity aims to power high drain devices wirelessly and put an end to that cable spaghetti in your living room. But 600 miles away in Pittsburgh, another company is working on powering low-consumption tech like keyboards and games controllers over longer distances using totally different means, radio waves. Look at this Christmas tree. If I show you in here, you can see that this is the transmitter. This is kicking out radio waves. These radio waves are picked up by a little chip embedded into the Christmas decoration, which then converts it into electricity, and that powers the LED. So look, I can move the decoration further away from the Christmas tree and it's still blue, still blue, still blue. Look, no wires. And crucially, no battery either. But that's not the coolest thing here. Powercast have developed a radio frequency powered wireless charging station for a range of tech, including a PlayStation controller. Now look. It's charging while it's in the tray. I'm moving further and further away from the tray. It's still charging. There's still a blue light. So what you can do is, after playing your day's worth of games, stick it in the tray, any position you like, overnight. When you wake up in the morning, a freshly, fully charged controller for you to play some more. But the big deal with RF wireless power is that in the modern world, RF energy is everywhere. Normal radio broadcasts generate it, as do mobile phones and Wi-Fi routers. So the really exciting application of this tech lies in the future when our keyboards or remote controls could have receivers embedded in them and harvest all that ambient power to operate, as Charlie Green demonstrated. So I've got a phone down here on the table, uh -huh. and what I'm going to do is call that phone. And what you'll see is the phone will emit radio waves. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Our circuitry and our antenna can capture those waves, turn them into energy, and power these LEDs. So you don't have to have a specific radio wave transmitter. You can use any number of devices which, through their regular means of usage, transmit waves. Correct. Both Powercast and Ytricity work in very unassuming buildings, but the research they're working on, the tech they're using inside these buildings, could very well change the world. In a few years' time, the only place we'll be seeing one of these 
could be in a museum. <laughs> I'm a big fan of wireless power. And what I love is that, you know, this is an idea that's been around for a long time. Yes. Tesla, at the turn of the century, a scientist, you know, he was talking about it. But what's amazing now is that it's within our grasp. Yeah. I mean, the stuff you were looking at, we're going to be using in our homes in three, three or five years' time. Yeah. All they're working on at the moment is getting the power exchange closer to 100%. Getting it efficient, because you lose Make, a lot, don't you? So much is lost in, in the ether yeah. as the transfer is being made. Uh, but it's very exciting stuff, definitely. Also something I found that's quite exciting, and is also another solution to reducing the number of cables that you have around the house, is this. This is the Wild Charge Power Pad. OK, basically, it will charge your small devices, especially mobile phones. What it does is it has a case which has four metallic points there which create a circuit when you place it on the pad. And instantly, it goes into and charging mode. And this is just like a protective case that you yep. normally get for a, your precious phone anyway. So yep. it's no great big... Great bit of kit. It really is. inexpensive as well. Yeah. Welcome back to The Gadget Show. Now, John and I are continuing in our scientific experiment to try and score a supersonic doll. But before that, it's time to check back with Gail, who's doing another wee experiment. Obviously not an experiment using... Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, this one is packed full of potential energy and potential uses. OK, I'm going to make elephant toothpaste. Now, I need to tell you two things first up. Number one, on this scale, do not try this at home. Number two, elephant's toothpaste is just a name. It's not an approved dental product for your elephants. Right, in this container here, I have 30% solution of hydrogen peroxide. And to this, I'm going to add a squirt of washing up liquid. Yeah, I'm going to squeeze! and some food colouring, the benefits of this will soon be revealed, but not before I add the key final ingredient. This is sodium iodide. This is when our party really gets started. Ready? Whoa! Look at that, bad boy! <laughs> That's amazing! That is fantastic, look at that! OK, so what actually made that happen? When I poured in the sodium iodide, it acted as a catalyst and caused the hydrogen peroxide to decompose, breaking down incredibly quickly to produce water and oxygen. The washing up liquid mixes with the water, while the escaping oxygen causes it to bubble up really quickly. Can you see what the food colouring's for now? It looks beautiful. Amazing. At higher concentrations, hydrogen peroxide can produce enormous power. In the famous Bell Rocket Belt, a 90% concentration is forced through a silver mesh which acts as a catalyst to produce oxygen and steam at a temperature of 720 degrees centigrade. This then shoots out of the belt's two nozzles, getting the pilot airborne. That was absolutely awesome. It's great, isn't it? Brilliant. And what's this? Well, we've got a miniature version of the science that goes into jet packs right here for you to do, and everyone can do it at home I as well. I love it. So it's not dangerous. It's, it's all household things. So what I need you to do is fill up half the beaker with the vinegar. OK. Then we need a wee dash of washing up liquid. Right, OK. Then little we dashette. need a little dash it, and we need a little bit of colouring to make it look pretty. Oh, this is so this is just to make it look good, is it? That's just to make it look good. Okay. And for our catalyst this time, we're going to use bicarbonate of soda. <laughs> so let's see what happens. Go on. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah. Oh, I think maybe I'll put too much <laughs> of that. No, but it's working. Look, it it's is working. In. Here you go. It's going in there. Go. And that's just from household stuff. Isn't that amazing? I like it. It's good. I like it. I think if I made a very very small. Jet jet pack. Pack for maybe like a hamster or something, <laughs> yeah. then, then it could work. Anyway, it's time to get back to the gadget show, Big Experiment. And it's a very big experiment indeed. In fact, it's a very fast one. Yeah, because John and I have been set the challenge of trying to investigate the science of speed by getting a football supersonic. Having already established that the human leg hasn't got anywhere near the power required to kick a ball at the speed of sound, I was hoping a stronger leg would do the job. So, the record for a human football kick is 80.1 miles an hour. The speed of sound is 767 miles an hour, about ten times as much. Surely, then, all I need to do is hoof my football ten times harder than a human can, and I'm in business. Meet the robotic leg. This robotic kicking machine was developed at Loughborough University for research into improving the design of footballs and the boots that kick them. But for me, it was its pure kicking power that I'd come for. It's designed to produce the perfect kick, 
It's ideal for my research, as it always hits the ball dead centre, transferring all its force into a top-speed kick. And that's what I was there to get. Oh, that's as high as the machine will go, and it's given me 144 kilometres an hour, and it's an improvement, but, ooh, not quite enough. So, what went wrong? Why, despite all that extra kicking force, did my ball only travel at 90 miles an hour? The reason the leg still isn't kicking the ball anything like as fast as the speed of sound is down to this rather impenetrable-looking equation. It's all about the relationship between the energy applied to an object, the kick, and its speed. Applying twice the force doesn't double the speed. In fact, to make the ball go twice as fast, I need four times the energy. And to make the ball go ten times faster than a human can kick it, I'm going to need a hundred times the energy. Blimey. It became very clear that we were going to have to find a pretty huge source of energy to get our football through the sound barrier. And I had a pretty good idea where to find one. There is a force that exerts its influence on us every day. And here in the bottom of this massive quarry, I'm in the perfect place to use it. I am, of course, talking about the big G. Gravity. Its mighty force causes faster acceleration than a Ferrari F430. Any object will accelerate downwards at 9.8 metres per second per second. That's not to 60 in 2.7 seconds. So with a big enough drop, gravity should drive my ball through the sound barrier. All right, John! Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! Oh, yes! That was brilliant! Brilliant it may have been, but John's biggest throw into the 40-metre-deep quarry didn't get us anywhere near the sound barrier, topping out at a measly 65 miles per hour. As my ball was falling through the air, it was being dragged down towards the ground by the force of gravity. However, as the ball got quicker, the drag from the air it was falling through increased until eventually the drag matched the pull of gravity and it couldn't accelerate any more. Which meant that however far it fell, my ball would never get any faster. I'd hit the wall known as terminal velocity. Breaking the sound barrier was proving rather tricky. So I decided to revert to my gun idea for my supersonic kick. But since a shotgun barrel was too small, I opted for something a little larger. This is basically just a giant pea shooter. But instead of my measly puff, this contains compressed air at a pressure of 600,000 newtons per square metre. And because I knew the diameter of my football was just under 22 centimetres, I could work out that with the 600,000 newtons per square metre of pressure from my air cannon, we should be able to kick the ball with over 200 times the force of gravity. Crucially, that's also more than 200 times more force than Jason's last effort. Right, Harry, give it some poke. Now! Whoa! <laughs> So, did the air cannon manage to send my ball supersonic? Look, yo! <laughs> Ooh, that's that's good. Look at the results. See how that's fast incredible. it is. Uh, no. It only managed 119.03 miles an hour. That's impressive. It's well, a lot faster than a human kick, isn't it? It is, but it's not quite fast enough. And that's because not all the compressed air actually hit the ball. Some simply escaped around the edges, and more significantly, because the ball is spherical, the compressed air didn't hit all parts of the ball at exactly the same moment. But that wasn't the end for me. I had one final idea to get my ball through that elusive sound barrier. This is a jet car. Inside is a Pratt & Whitney engine usually found in massive military helicopters. The jet engine can power this show car to over 330 miles an hour in just five seconds. It kicks out 5,000 pounds of thrust. Surely that must be enough to make my ball go supersonic. All I had to do was utilise that force for one jet-powered spectacular kick. 
With the engine running, I was going to throw my ball into the raw power of the jet's exhaust when it was on full afterburn. At this moment, it would be producing 10,000 horsepower. Surely that would be enough to send my ball supersonic. I tried again and again, but amazingly, it wasn't enough. The jet car failed for exactly the same reason as the air mortar. Because it's round, a lot of the force of the jet deflected around the ball. So, jets have failed to provide a supersonic kick for John, but for me, I was thinking jet power could be the answer. Since the sound barrier was first broken by Chuck Yeager flying the Bell X-1 in 1947, jets have just got faster and faster. If I could put my ball in one and fly it through the goal, then I'd have this whole challenge in the bag. Except military jets are a little bit too big to fit into my goal because they've got to carry lots of fuel and, you know, bombs and stuff. So, I'm going to have to downscale. This is a scaled-down model of a fast jet aircraft with a scaled-down gas turbine engine inside. And to go with it, naturally, I've got a scaled-down football. OK, we've got clearance in the tower, Steve. Wag and roll. Oh, yes. This plane holds the key to getting my ball supersonic. Its sleek shape means that it has a very low coefficient of drag. That means its shape allows it to cut through the air molecules around it, creating very little drag, and drag is the enemy of speed, as it takes energy to overcome it. So an aerodynamic shape like this plane actually needs less power to break the sound barrier than an unaerodynamic one like, say, my football. That is amazing, isn't it? Woo! Look at that! Climbing into the sky! After a climb to 1,000 feet, the plane accelerated towards the runway. God, that dive! This is where my ball goes supersonic. Look at this! Woo! Hey, beat that, Mr Bentley! That has got to be supersonic if you scale it up. In fact, my RC jet was clocked at 200 miles per hour, nowhere near the actual speed of sound. Look at that. But my model is only 1 50th of the real size, so just imagine if the speed was scaled up with the size. So we hadn't cracked it yet, but we were getting closer all the time. <laughs> wow! I was truly astonished by that fighter jet. I mean, actually flying it by remote control at those speeds is such an amazing feat. It is incredible. I've flown a lot of model aircraft in my time, mm. but nothing like that. I wouldn't get anywhere near it because, I mean, you've got to be an absolute professional. Now it's time for the last of Gao's little experiments, and this time she's using possibly the most efficient way of freezing stuff to make a little snack. It's a lovely, sunny-ish kind of day, and I'm feeling a bit peckish. And what I really fancy right now is some ice cream. So luckily for me, I have all the ingredients. I have my cream. There we go. I have my ice and sugar. And I've got my milk. OK? Now I'm going to mix it all together, add my vanilla essence to make it a wee bit tastier. But the thing is, I want my ice cream now. I don't want to wait for this to freeze. But luckily for me, in this container here, I've got liquid nitrogen, a liquefied atmospheric gas currently being stored at a very, very cold minus 196 degrees Celsius. So what I'll do is I'm going to add it <laughs> to my ice cream portion. Here we go. When exposed to atmospheric pressure, the liquid nitrogen boils. Look at that! <laughs> That's amazing! And this causes rapid freezing on contact with the creamy liquid. Because liquid nitrogen can dry freeze stuff pretty much instantly, it has practical uses, such as cell and embryo preservation, and weirdly is now used to freeze people and their pets in the hope of later reanimation. But what about my creation? Proper frothy ice cream. Now, <laughs> this is the telling bit, if it's going to be safe enough for me to eat. OK. It's brilliant! It's really tasty, yummy ice cream. That's excellent! Ice cream in under a minute. 
Welcome back. Now it's time to get down to the serious business of accelerating particles. The particles in one of these, to be precise, a football. Because John and I have been challenged to send a football supersonic. Yes, in the pursuit of scientific knowledge, we're trying to make a football fly into a goal at a speed exceeding the speed of sound. That's more than 767 miles an hour. It's pretty darn fast. A very tall order. And after some extremely interesting research, Dr Bradbury and I are ready for our most serious, most proper attempts yet. So, this is it. Our final chance to get a football Supersonic. We've each got two footballs and two methods of trying to score a supersonic goal. So we better get on with it. Mm. Uh, oh. The method I was adopting to try and score a supersonic goal was to use a massive kicking force. And for my first serious shot at goal, I was going to use something called a high G gun. The high G gun uses a compressed air cannon to kick a one ton sled down a track. Normally, it's used for crash testing, but today, its massive kicking power is going to be used on something quite different. The whole room is set up to monitor the track. There's a high-speed camera here, a high-speed camera here, high-speed camera there, and they're all running at such a fast frame rate, they need a huge amount of light to capture the action. I'd had my first taste of high-speed kicking with the compressed air mortar. And the high G gun is really just a massive version of that. Once the system is fully pressurized, it can generate up to 100 G. G, or G force, is the rate of acceleration due to gravity. And 100 G is 30 times more than Jason's dragster. So I have high hopes that the gun's raw power will kick me a supersonic goal. OK, are we ready? This is very exciting. All that stood between me and inevitable victory Build up is oh, oh, my Lord, this is... was a crash test dummy goalkeeper. Oh. <laughs> I didn't, didn't get through the goal, I didn't get anywhere <laughs> near the goal. <laughs> Look, the pictures wow. are already, already the pictures are coming up. Oh! That's got to hurt your, your big toe yeah, It was actually that. quite a good hit, I think. I think I'm quite pleased with that. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Using computer analysis of the footage, the team at Myra calculated that my ball experienced an acceleration of 61 G. Ooh, that's good. Whoa, that's a serious Ooh. amount of G-force, isn't it? It is, isn't it? I think it's our best so far. But what about the speed? Well, in fact, it was a disappointing 113 miles an hour. The reason for that was that while the ball experienced incredibly high acceleration from the kick of the boot, it only lasted for milliseconds before the ball left the boot and began to decelerate. I'm a bit disappointed. The problem was 61G just for a fraction of a second. If I managed to hold it up for two seconds, got a bit of follow-through, I'd have broken the sound barrier. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I feel bad for you. It was a good effort, but unfortunately, it wasn't good enough. You've got one more try. <laughs> I'm up next. So it was back to the quarry for my first attempt at a supersonic goal. Because I'd decided that to achieve success, I needed to attach my ball to something delivering continuous power, I'd enlisted the help of rocket guru Ben Jarvis, who promised me that if anyone could get my ball supersonic, it would be him. This is my rocket. This is where my football's going to go. And this is my three-ton tensioned wire that's going to carry it at supersonic speed into that goal. Before fitting the rocket with its engine, the all-important ball had to be fixed securely into position. This is the business end of my rocket. The I-Class motor I've chosen for it. All I need to do is insert it in there, hook up the igniter and press my button. The class of the engine defines how powerful it is and mine should deliver a constant force of nearly 600 newtons. My rocket ticked all the boxes for big speeds. It had a very high power-to-weight ratio and was very aerodynamic. On paper, it should have been capable of at least 800 miles per hour. But that's without carrying an unaerodynamic football. The big question was how much would the big round white thing on its nose slow it down? OK, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's get that football supersonic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, yeah! Oh. Now, that may have looked fast, and it was taking only one second to cover the 100 metres between the start and the goal. Did you see that go? As it entered the goal, my rocket was clocked at 433.97 miles per hour. Clearly, it was only our old enemy drag caused by the unaerodynamic football that stopped the rocket breaking the 767 miles per hour sound barrier. Well, I may have scored the fastest goal in history, but that footy is not going to look very good in the trophy cabinet, is it? No, and you can stop being so pleased with yourself because it obviously wasn't supersonic, and I've got something over there that could give it even more welly. <laughs> My last hope at getting the ball to travel faster than the speed of sound rested on gadget show pyrotechnics expert Harry. He'd promised me that with some high-power explosives, it would be me that would score the supersonic goal. Just like the air mortar I used before, this basically involves putting an enormous force behind the ball and hoping that acceleration equals force divided by mass. My force is big, my mass is small, so my acceleration should be huge. But one thing we do know is that too much force and the ball will be blown to shreds. Three, two, one. The sheer force of the explosive acceleration was too much for the ball and it disintegrated. But where is it? I'm it's, not sure it's everywhere, that's where it is. Ah! Oh, yeah, there's a bit. Look. Bits of ball. Look! Let's have a look. Some of it. Hang on, here's some more. Yeah. Oh, is that cute? Look. <laughs> Using the slow-mo camera, we can see that the fastest bit of ball travelled through the net at about 250 miles per hour. The ball exploded, dissipating the force, and so it had no chance of breaking the sound barrier. Which left my second rocket as our final hope. And this bad boy was three times more powerful than the first. That didn't help the aerodynamics issue, but I got a solution for that. One of the problems I'm facing is that the football is not a particularly aerodynamic device. Bring on my latest invention. Hey! <laughs> Stick it in here. You see? Job done. With the unaerodynamic football, now the rocket's payload, there was only a couple of seconds between me and inevitable victory. This is it. My last chance to get supersonic. Here I go. <sighs> OK. <laughs> but of course, this was rocket science, and with rockets, nothing is ever simple. The rocket was so darn powerful, it stretched its guide wire, causing slack, and with its punctured football payload making it unstable, it couldn't stay on a straight trajectory. A lot of the power was wasted, and sadly, my last attempt only reached 410 miles an hour, as it perfectly bisected the crossbar. Oh! It was so close! It was very fast! That second rocket, if it hadn't gone into that whole spiral thing, Ooh. it would have made it. But that looked yeah. great when it did that. It <laughs> I really agree. It was very dramatic. <laughs> yeah. At least your ball's more intact than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can see why the essence of burnt football isn't one of the world's great perfumes. Yeah, Ooh, I'm, not, I'm not yeah. liking that smell right now. I'll tell you what, though, we did achieve, mm. OK? The fastest goal ever. Probably. Mm. <laughs> Good. Just about. Well, on that probably positive note, that's it from the Gadget Show's big experiment. See you, see next, you next time. time. See you next time.